Welcome to Crazy Nurse RN Hub, where learning becomes a tradition. Come, join me as we explore the multifaceted worlds of nursing. Hi there, student nurses. My name is Crystal Merdukanes, clinical instructor teaching fundamentals of nursing practice. Today, we will continue our lecture on promoting psychosocial health in terms of stress and coping and loss, grieving, and death. To begin with, let's discuss stress and coping. Stress is a universal phenomenon. All people experience it. Parents refer to the stress of raising children, working people talk to the stress of their jobs, and students at all levels talk of the stress of school. Stress can result from both positive and negative experiences. A bride preparing for her wedding, a graduate preparing to start a new job, and a husband concerned about caring for his wife and family following a diagnosis of care all experience stress reactions. The concept of stress is important because it provides a way of understanding the person as a being who responds in totality to mind, the body, and the spirit, to a variety of changes that take place in daily life. Stress is a condition in which an individual experiences changes in normal balance state. A stressor, on the other hand, is any event or stimulus that causes an individual to experience stress. Coping strategies, also known as coping responses or coping mechanisms, these are responses when a person faces stressors. There are many sources of stress. They can be broadly classified as internal or external stressors, or developmental or situational stressors. Internal stressors originate within a person, for example, infection or feeling of depression. External stressors, on the other hand, originate outside the individual, for example, a move to another city, a death in the family, or pressure from peers. We also have developmental stressors. It occurs at predictable times throughout an individual's life. So we have here a table of the selected stressors associated with developmental stages. So for children, stressors are beginning school, establishing peer relationships, peer competition. For adolescent, we have changing physique, Relationships involving sexual attraction, exploring independence, and choosing a career. For young adults, we have marriage, living home, managing a home, getting started in an occupation, continuing one's education, and children. For middle adult, we have physical changes of aging, maintaining social status and standard of living, helping teenage children to become independent, and aging parents. And lastly, we have older adult. Stressors are decreasing physical abilities and health, changes in residence, retirement and reduced income, and death of spouse and friends. Next, we have situational stressors. These are unpredictable and may occur at any time during life. Situational stress may be positive or negative. Examples of situational stress include death of a family member, marriage or divorce, birth of a child, new job, and illness. The degree to which any of these events have positive or negative effects depends to some extent on the individual's developmental stage. For example, the death of a parent may be more stressful for a 12-year-old than for a 40-year-old. Next, let's proceed to the effects of stress. Stress can have physical, emotional, intellectual, social, and spiritual consequences. Usually, the effects are mixed because stress affects the whole person 
physically, stress can threaten a person's physiological homeostasis. Emotionally, stress can produce negative or non-constructive feelings about the self. Intellectually, stress can influence a person's perceptual and problem-solving abilities. Socially, stress can alter a person's relationships with others. And spiritually, stress can challenge one's beliefs and values. Models of stress assist nurses to predict stressors in a particular situation and to understand the individual's responses. Nurses can use these models to assist clients in strengthening healthy coping responses and in adjusting unhealthy and productive responses. Three main models of stress are stimulus-based models, response-based models, and transactional-based models models. First, let's discuss stimulus-based models. In stimulus-based stress models, stress is defined as a stimulus, a life event or set of circumstances that arouses physiological and or psychological reactions that may increase the individual's vulnerability to illness. Next is response-based models. Stress may also be considered as a response. This definition was developed and described by Selye as the non-specific response of the body to any kind of demand made upon it. Now let's discuss General Adaptation Syndrome or GAS. It is also known as Stress Syndrome. Celia's stress response is characterized by a chain or pattern of physiological events. To differentiate the cause of stress from the response to stress, Celia used the term stressor to denote any factor that produces stress and disturbs the body's equilibrium. Stress can be observed only by the changes it produces in the body. This response of the body, the stress syndrome or gas, occurs with the release of certain adaptive hormones and subsequent changes in the structure and chemical composition of the body. Parts of the body affected by stress are gastrointestinal tract, the adrenal glands, and the lymphatic structures. With prolonged stress, deep ulcers appear in the lining of the stomach. The adrenal glands enlarge considerably and the lymphatic structures such as thymus, spleen, and lymph nodes atrophies or shrink. Now let's discuss the local adaptation syndrome or the LAS. Besides adapting globally, the body reacts locally to stress. That is, one organ or a part of the body reacts alone. One example of LAS is inflammation. Selye proposed that both the gas and LAS have three stages. We have alarm reaction, resistance, and exhaustion. For alarm reaction, it is the initial reaction of the body, which alerts the body's defenses. Celia divided these stages into two parts, the shock phase and the counter shock phase. During the shock phase, the stressor may be perceived consciously or unconsciously by the person. Stressors stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, which stimulates the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases corticotropin-releasing hormone, which stimulates the anterior pituitary gland to release adrenocorticotropic hormone. During times of stress, the adrenal medulla secretes epinephrine and norepinephrine in response to sympathetic stimulation. Significant body responses to epinephrine include the following. So we have here the fight or flight responses. There is an increased myocardial contractility, which increases cardiac output and blood flow to active muscles. We also have bronchial dilation, which allows increased oxygen intake. We also have increased blood clotting, increase cellular metabolism, and lastly, increase fat mobilization to provide energy and to synthesize other compounds needed by the body. 
The second part of the alarm reaction is called countershock phase. During this time, the changes produced in the body during the shock phase are reversed. A person is best mobilized to react during the shock phase of the alarm reaction. Next, we have the stage of resistance. And it is the second stage in the gas and last syndromes. The stage of resistance is when the body's adaptations take place. In other words, the body attempts to cope with the stressors and to limit the stressor to the smallest area of the body that can deal with it. Next, we have the stage of exhaustion. During the third stage, the adaptation that the body made during the second stage cannot be maintained. This means that the waste used to cope with the stressor have been exhausted. If adaptation has not overcome the stressor, the stress effects may spread to the entire body. At the end of this stage, the body may either rest and return to normal or death may be the ultimate consequence. The end of this stage depends largely on the adaptive energy resources of the individual. The severity of the stressor and the external adaptive resources provided, such as oxygen. Here is an illustration of the three stages of adaptation to stress. The alarm reaction, the stage of resistance, and the stage of exhaustion. So we have here the homeostasis. Alarm, resistance, exhaustion, which can lead to recovery or death. Transactional theories of stress are based on the work of Lazarus, who stated that the stimulus theory and the response theory do not consider individual differences. He emphasizes that people and groups differ in their sensitivity and vulnerability to certain types of events as well as in their interpretations and reactions. In terms of illness, one person may respond with denial, another with anxiety, and still another with depression. Lazarus' transactional stress theory encompasses a set of cognitive, affective, and adaptive or coping responses that arise out of person-to-environment transactions. The person and the environment are inseparable, each affects and is affected by the other. Now let's discuss the indicators of stress. Indicators of an individual stress may be physiological, psychological, or cognitive. For the physiological indicators, responses to stress vary depending on the individual's perception of events. The physiological signs and symptoms of stress result from activation of the sympathetic and neuroendocrine systems of the body. Clinical manifestations list physiological indicators of stress. Next is psychological indicators. Psychological manifestations of stress include anxiety, fear, anger, depression, and unconscious ego defense mechanisms. Some coping patterns are helpful. Others are a hindrance depending on the situation and the length of time they are used or experienced. First is anxiety. It is a common reaction to stress. And it is a state of mental uneasiness, apprehension, dread, or foreboding, or a feeling of helpless related to an impending or anticipated unidentified threat to self or significant relationships. Anxiety can be experienced at the conscious, subconscious, or unconscious level. There are four levels of anxiety. First, we have mild anxiety, then moderate anxiety, severe anxiety, and lastly, we have panic. For mild anxiety, it produces a slight arousal that enhances perception, learning, and productive abilities. Most healthy people experience mild anxiety, perhaps as a feeling of mild restlessness, that prompts a person to seek information and ask questions. Next is moderate anxiety. 
it increases the arousal to a point where the person expresses feelings of tension, nervousness, or concern. Perceptual abilities are narrowed. Attention is focused more on a particular aspect of a situation than a peripheral activities. Next, we have severe anxiety. It consumes most of the person's energies and requires interventions. Perception is further decreased. The person is unable to focus on what is really happening, focuses on only one detail of the situation, generating the anxiety. Lastly, we have panic. It is an overpowering, frightening level of anxiety causing the person to lose control. It is less frequently experienced than other levels of anxiety. The perception of a panicked person can be affected to the degree that the person distorts events. Now let's discuss fear. Fear is an emotion or feeling of apprehension aroused by impending or seeming danger, pain, or another perceived threat. The fear may be in response to something that has already occurred, in response to an immediate or current threat, or in response to something the person believes will happen. Anxiety and fear differ in four ways. The source of anxiety may not be identified. The source of fear is identified. Anxiety is related to the future, that is, to an anticipated event. Fear is related to the past, present, and future. Anxiety is vague, whereas fear is definite. Anxiety results from psychological or emotional conflict. Fear results from a specific physical or psychological entity. Next, we have anger. Anger is an emotional state consisting of a subjective feeling of animosity or strong displeasure. A verbal expression of anger can be a signal to others of one's internal psychological discomfort and a call for assistance to deal with perceived stress. Next is depression. Depression is a common reaction to events that seem overwhelming or negative. It is an extreme feeling of sadness, despair, dejection, lack of worth, or emptiness. Now let's have the ego defense mechanism. These are unconscious psychological adaptive mechanisms or a mental mechanisms that develop as the personality attempts to defend itself, establish compromises among conflicting impulses, and calm inner tensions. Defense mechanisms are the unconscious mind working to protect the person from anxiety. They can be precursors to conscious cognitive coping mechanisms that will ultimately solve the problem. Like some verbal and motor responses, defense mechanisms release tension. Now let's have the cognitive indicators. Cognitive indicators of stress are thinking responses that include problem-solving, structuring, self-control or self-discipline, suppression, and fantasy. First is problem-solving. It involves thinking through the threatening situation using specific steps to arrive at a solution. The person assesses the situation or problem, analyzes or defines it, chooses alternatives, and carries out the selected alternative and evaluates whether the solution succeeded. Next is structuring. It is the arrangement or manipulation of a situation so threatening events do not occur. For example, a nurse can structure or control an interview with a client by asking only direct, closed questions so that client will not wander into areas that may be stressful. Next is self-control or discipline. It is assuming a manner and facial expression that convey a sense of being in control or in charge. When self-control prevents panic and harmful or non-productive actions in a threatening situation, it is helpful response that conveys strength. 
Next is suppression. It is consciously and willfully putting a thought or feeling out of mind. I won't deal with that today. I'll do it tomorrow. This response relieves stress temporarily but does not solve the problem. And lastly, fantasy or daydreaming. It is to make believe. Unfulfilled wishes and desires are imagined as fulfilled, or a threatening experience is reworked or replayed, so it ends differently from reality. Experiences can be relieved, everyday problems solved, and plans for the future made. The outcome of current problems may also be fantasized. For example, a client awaiting the results of a breast biopsy may fantasize the surgeon is saying, you do not have cancer. Fantasy responses can be helpful if they lead to problem solving. For example, the client awaiting breast biopsy results might say to herself, even if the doctor says, you have a cancer, as long as he also says it can be treated, I can accept it. Fantasies can be destructive and non-productive if a person uses them to excess and retreats from reality. Now let's discuss coping. It is a cognitive and behavioral effort to manage specific external and or internal demands that are appraised as taxing or exceeding the resources of the person. It may be described as dealing with change successfully or unsuccessfully. Coping may be described as dealing with change successfully or unsuccessfully. A coping strategy or coping mechanism is a natural or learned way of responding to a changing environment or specific problem or situation. There are two types of coping strategies that have been described. First, we have problem-focused and emotion-focused. Problem-focused coping, it refers to efforts to improve a situation by making changes or taking action. On the other hand, emotion-focused coping includes thoughts and actions that relieve emotional distress. It does not improve the situation, but the person often feels better. Both types of strategies usually occur together. Coping strategies are also viewed as long-term or short-term. Long-term coping strategies can be constructive and practical. In certain situations, talking with others and trying to find out more about the situation are long-term strategies. Other long-term strategies include a change in lifestyle patterns, such as eating a healthy diet and exercising regularly, balancing leisure time with working, or using problem-solving and decision-making instead of anger or other non-constructive responses. For short-term coping strategies, it can reduce stress to a tolerable time temporarily, but are ineffective ways to permanently deal with reality. They may even have destructive or detrimental effect on the person. Examples of short-term strategies are using alcoholic beverages or drugs, daydreaming and fantasizing, relying on the belief that everything will work out, and giving in to others to avoid anger. Coping can be adaptive or maladaptive. Adaptive coping helps the person to deal effectively with stressful events and minimizes the stress associated with them. It is also called as effective coping. On the other hand, maladaptive coping can cause unnecessary distress for the person and others associated with the person or stressful event. It is also called as ineffective coping. Although the coping behavior may not always seem appropriate, the nurse needs to remember that coping is always purposeful. Now let's discuss caregiver burden. If the duration of the stressors is extended beyond the coping powers of the individual, the person becomes exhausted and may develop increased susceptibility to health problems. Caregiver burden is a reaction to a long-term stress that is seen in family members who undertake the care of a person in the home for a long period. 
and it produces responses such as chronic fatigue, sleeping difficulties, and high blood pressure. In the case of caregiver burden, the caregiver also becomes the nurse's client and a care plan to intervene should be created. Next, we have crisis. It is an acute, time-limited state of disequilibrium resulting from situational, developmental, or societal source of stress. A person in crisis is temporarily unable to cope with or adapt to stressor by using previous methods of problem solving. People in crisis generally have a distorted perception of the event and do not have adequate situational support or coping mechanisms. This leads to crisis intervention. It is a process that includes not only the client in crisis but also various members of the client support network. It is also a short-term helping process of assisting clients to work through a crisis to its resolution and restore their pre-crisis level of functioning. People who intervene in crisis come from the fields of nursing, medicine, psychology, social work, and theology. Police officers, teachers, school guidance counselors, and rescue workers, among others, are often on the spot in moments of crisis. Now let's discuss burnout. Although most nurses cope effectively with the physical and emotional demands of nursing, in some situations, nurses become overwhelmed and develop burnout. Burnout is a complex syndrome of behaviors that can be likened to the exhaustion stage of the general adaptation syndrome. The nurse with burnout manifests physical and emotional depletion, a negative attitude, and self-concept and feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. Finally, we have loss, grieving, and death. Everyone experiences loss, grieving, and death during his or her life. People may suffer the loss of valued relationships through life changes, such as moving from one city to another, separation or divorce, or the death of a parent, spouse, or friend. People may grieve changing life roles as they watch grown children leave home or they retire from their lifelong work. Losing valued material objects through theft or natural disaster can evoke feelings of grief and loss. When people's lives are affected by civil or national strife, they may grieve the loss of valued ideals such as safety, freedom, or democracy. In the clinical setting, the nurse encounters clients who may experience grief related to declining health, loss of a body part, terminal illness, or the impending death of self or a significant other. The nurse may also work with clients in community settings who are grieving losses related to a personal crisis, such as divorce, separation, financial loss, or disaster, such as war, earthquakes, or terrorism. Therefore, it is important for the nurse to understand the significance of loss and develop the ability to assist clients as they work through the grieving process. Nurses may interact with dying clients and their families or caregivers in a variety of settings, from a fetal demise such as death of an unborn child to the adolescent victim of an accident to the older client who finally succumbs to a chronic illness. Nurses must recognize the influences on the dying process, legal, ethical, spiritual, biologic, psychological, and be prepared to provide sensitive, skilled, and supportive care to all those affected. Loss is an actual or potential situation in which something that is valued is changed or no longer available People can experience the loss of body image, significant other, a sense of well-being, a job, personal possessions, or beliefs. Illness and hospitalization often produce losses. Death, on the other hand, is a loss both for the dying person and for those who survive. Although death is inevitable, 
It can stimulate people to grow in their understanding of themselves and others. People experiencing loss often search for the meaning of the event, and it is generally accepted that finding meaning is needed in order for healing to occur. However, individuals can be well-adjusted without searching for meaning, and even those who find meaning may not see it as an end point, but rather as an ongoing process. So here are the general types of losses. We have the actual loss and perceived loss. An actual loss can be recognized by others. A perceived loss, on the other hand, is experienced by one person but cannot be verified by others. We also have your psychological loss. This is often perceived losses because they are not directly verified. For example, a woman who leaves her employment to care for her children at home may perceive a loss of independence and freedom. Both losses can be anticipatory. Anticipatory loss can be actual and perceived loss. It is experienced before the loss actually occurs. For example, a woman whose husband is dying may experience actual loss in anticipation of his death. Next, we have your situational loss. Losing one's job, the death of a child, and losing functional ability because of acute illness or injury. We also have developmental loss. These are losses that occur in normal development, which to some extent be anticipated and prepared for. Examples are departure of grown children from the home, retirement from career, and the death of aged parents. There are many sources of loss. Loss of an aspect of oneself, a body part, a physiological function, or a psychological attribute. Loss of an object external to oneself, separation from a familiar environment, and loss of a loved or valued person. First, we have the aspect of self. Losing an aspect of self changes a person's body image even though the loss may not be obvious. A face card from a burn is generally obvious loss of part of the stomach or loss of the ability to feel emotion may not be as obvious. The degree to which these losses affect a person largely depends on the integrity of the person's body image. We also have your external objects. Loss of an external object includes loss of inanimate objects that have importance to the person, such as losing money or the burning down of a family's house. We also have the loss of animate or live objects, such as pets that provide love and companionship. Also, we have your familiar environment. Separation from an environment and people who provided security can cause a sense of loss. The six-year-old is likely to feel lost when first leaving the home environment to attend school. The university student who moves away from home for the first time also experiences a sense of loss. Lastly, we have loved ones. Losing a loved one or valued person through illness, divorce, separation, or death can be very disturbing. In some illnesses, such as Alzheimer's dementia, a person may undergo personality change that make friends and family feel that they have lost that person. The death of a loved one is a permanent and complete loss. Now let's discuss grief. Grief is the total response to the emotional experience related to loss. Grief is manifested in thoughts, feelings, and behaviors associated with overwhelming distress or sorrow. We also have a term called bereavement. It is the subjective response experienced by the surviving loved ones. Also, we have mourning. It is the behavioral process through which a grief is eventually resolved or altered. It is often influenced by culture, spiritual beliefs, and custom. Grief and mourning are experienced not only by the person who faces the death of a loved one, but also by the person who suffers another kinds of losses, 
Grieving permits the individual to cope with the loss gradually and to accept it as part of reality. Grief is a social process. It is best shared and carried out with the assistance of others. Now let's proceed to the types of grief responses. A normal grief reaction may be abbreviated or anticipatory. We also have your disenfranchised grief and complicated grief. When we say abbreviated grief, it is a normal grief reaction. It is brief but genuinely felt. This can occur when the lost object is not significantly important to the grieving person or may have been replaced immediately by another equally esteemed object. Next, we have your anticipatory grief. It is a normal grief reaction. It is experienced in advance of the event such as the wife who grieves before her ailing husband dies. A young person may grieve before an operation that will leave a scar. Because many of the normal symptoms of grief will have already been expressed in anticipation, the reaction when the loss actually occurs is sometimes quite abbreviated. Next, we have your disenfranchised grief. It occurs when a person is unable to acknowledge the loss to other people. Situations in which this may occur often relate to a socially unacceptable loss that cannot be spoken about, such as suicide, abortion, or giving a child up for adoption. Other examples include losses of relationships and are socially unsanctioned and may not be known to others, such as homosexuality or extramarital relationships. We also have your complicated grief. It is an unhealthy grief, and it is also known as pathologic grief. It exists when the strategies to cope with the loss are maladaptive and out of proportion or inconsistent with cultural, religious, or age-appropriate norms. The disorder, referred to by physician as persistent complex bereavement disorder, may be said to exist if the preoccupation lasts for more than six months and leads to reduced ability to function formally. Many factors can contribute to complicated grief, including a prior traumatic loss, family or cultural barriers to the emotional expression of grief, sudden death, strained relationships between the survivor and the deceased, and lack of adequate support for the survivor. Complicated grief may take several forms, namely unresolved or chronic grief, inhibited grief, delayed grief, exaggerated grief. Unresolved or chronic grief is extended in length and severity. The same signs are expressed as with normal grief, but the bereaved may also have difficulty expressing the grief, may deny the loss, or may grieve beyond the expected time. With inhibited grief, many of the normal symptoms of grief are suppressed, and other effects, including somatic, are experienced instead. We also have delayed grief. It occurs when feelings are purposely or subconsciously suppressed until a much later time. Lastly, we have the exaggerated grief. A survivor who appears to be using dangerous activities as a method to lessen the pain of grieving may experience this form of complicated grief. Next, let's discuss the stages of grieving. Many authors have described stages or phases of grieving. Perhaps the most well-known of them are Kabler ross 1969 Stages or the phases of grieving, the Dabda. We also have Engel, 1964, the six stages of grieving, and Sanders, 1998, five phases of bereavement. So here is the client responses and nursing implication in Kabler-Ross stages of grieving. Kabler-Ross identified five stages of grieving, namely denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. We also have Engel's stages of grieving. So here are the stages, shock and disbelief, developing awareness, restitution, resolving the loss, 
idealization, and outcome. And lastly, we have Sanders phases of bereavement. We have shock, awareness of loss, conservation or withdrawal, healing, the turning point, and renewal. Now let's proceed to the manifestation of grief. Manifestations of grief considered normal include verbalization of loss, crying, sleep disturbance, loss of appetite, and difficulty concentrating. On the other hand, the complicated grieving may be characterized by extended time of denial, depression, severe physiological symptoms, and suicidal thoughts. So here are the factors influencing the loss and grief responses. These factors include first, age. Age affects a person's understanding of and reaction to loss. With familiarity, people usually increase their understanding and acceptance of life, loss, and death. Next is significance of the loss. The significance of a loss depends on the perception of the individual experiencing the loss. One person may experience a great sense of loss over a divorce. Another may find it only mild disrupting. Next is culture. Culture influences an individual's reaction to loss. How grief is expressed is often determined by the customs of the culture. We also have spiritual beliefs. Spiritual beliefs and practices greatly influence both a person's reaction to loss and subsequent behavior. Most religious groups have practices related to dying, and these are often important to the client and support people. Next, we have gender. Males are frequently expected to be strong and show very little emotion during grief, whereas it is acceptable for females to show grief by crying. When a wife dies, the husband, who is the chief mourner, may be expected to repress his own emotions and to comfort sons and daughters in their grieving. We also have socioeconomic status. The socioeconomic status of an individual often affects the support system available at the time of a loss. A pension plan or insurance, for example, can offer an individual who is widowed or disabled a choice of way to deal with a loss. A person who is confronted with both severe loss and economic hardship may not be able to cope with either. Next, we have support systems. The people closest to the grieving individual are often the first to recognize and provide needed emotional, physical, and functional assistance. However, because many people are uncomfortable or inexperienced in dealing with losses, the usual support people may instead withdraw from the grieving individual. And lastly, we have the cause of loss or death. Individual and societal views on the cause of a loss or death may significantly influence the grief response. Some diseases are considered clean, such as cardiovascular disorders, and engender compassion, whereas others may be viewed as repulsive and less unfortunate. Now let's discuss the heart-lung death. It is the traditional clinical signs of death where there is cessation of apical pulse, respiration, and blood pressure. We also have cerebral or higher brain death. It is another definition of death, which occurs when the higher brain center the cerebral cortex is irreversibly destroyed. In this case, there is a clinical syndrome characterized by the permanent loss of cerebral and brainstem function manifested by absence of responsiveness to external stimuli, absence of cephalic reflexes, and apnea. Now let's discuss the three types of awareness that have been described as closed awareness, mutual pretense, and open awareness. In closed awareness, the client is not made aware of impending death. The family may choose this because they do not completely understand why the client is ill or they believe that the client will recover. The primary care provider may believe it is best not to communicate a diagnosis or prognosis to the client. 
nursing personnel may experience an ethical problem in this situation. With mutual pretense, however, the client, family, and healthcare personnel know that the prognosis is terminal but do not talk about it and make an effort not to raise the subject. Sometimes the client refrains from discussing death to protect the family from distress, and the client may also sense discomfort on the part of healthcare personnel and therefore not bring up the subject. Mutual pretense permits the client a degree of privacy and dignity, but it places a heavy burden on the dying person who then has no one in whom to confide. Lastly, we have open awareness. The client and others know about the impending death and feel comfortable discussing it. Even though it is difficult, this awareness provides the client an opportunity to finalize affairs and even participate in planning funeral arrangement. Now let's discuss hospice care. It focuses on the support and care of the dying person and family with the goal of facilitating a peaceful and dignified death. Hospice care is based on holistic concepts, emphasizes care to improve quality of life rather than cure, supports the client and family through the dying process, and supports the family through bereavement. Palliative care, on the other hand, is an approach that improves the quality of life of clients and their families facing the problem associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychological, and spiritual. The palliative care service facilitates religious, spiritual, and cultural rituals or practices as described by patient and family, especially at and after the time of death. This care may differ from hospice because the client is not necessarily believed to be imminently dying. Both hospice and palliative care can include end-of-life care, that is the care provided in the final weeks before death. Now let's proceed to post-mortem care. So we have terms here. First, we have your rigor mortis. It is the stiffening of the body that occurs about 2 to 4 hours after death. Rigor mortis starts in the involuntary muscles, such as heart, bladder, and so on, then progresses to head, neck, and trunk, and finally reaches the extremities. Next, we have your algor mortis. It is the gradual decrease of the body temperature after death. When blood circulation terminates and the hypothalamus ceases to function, body temperature falls about 1 degree Celsius per hour, until it reaches room temperature. Simultaneously, the skin loses its elasticity and can easily be broken when removing dressings and adhesive tapes. After blood circulation has ceased, the red blood cells breaks down and releasing hemoglobin, which discolors the surrounding tissues. This discoloration, referred to as liver mortis, appears in the lowermost or dependent areas of the body. For the post-mortem care, we have to check the client's religious rituals and make every attempt to comply. If family or friends wish to view the body, make an environment as clean and as pleasant as possible, and make body appear natural and comfortable. And also you have to remove all unnecessary equipment, soiled linen, and supplies from the bedside. Follow agency policy when caring for tubes. You also have to place body in a supine position. Place arms either at side, palm down, or across the abdomen. Place one pillow under the head and shoulders. Closed eyelids, insert dentures, and close mouth. Wash soiled areas of the body. Place absorbent pads under the buttocks. Place a clean gown on the client, brush and comb the hair, remove all jewelry except a wedding band which is taped to the finger. Adjust top bed linen to cover the client to the shoulders, provide soft lighting and chairs for the family.
After body viewed by family, you have to leave risk identification tag on and you have to apply additional identification tags. You also have to wrap body in a shroud, apply identification to outside of the shroud, take body to the morgue or arrange to have mortician or undertaker pick it up from the client's room, and handle the seed with dignity. Your mortician or undertaker, this is a person trained in the care of the dead. And your shroud is a large piece of plastic or cotton material used to enclose a body after death. The nurse collects data in accordance with desired outcomes, listen to clients' reports of feelings in control of the environment surrounding death. Observe clients' relationships and listen to clients' thoughts, feelings related to hopelessness and powerlessness. I believe this is the end of our lecture on the topic promoting psychosocial health. Thank you so much for listening.